And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and that's Kyle, Kyle Middleton. Um, Kyle uh, was born in, uh, in the Big Smoke in, in Gauteng, um, the Gauteng province of, the, uh, of South Africa. Um, and he spent his early childhood there and then later on moved to the Klaseri private nature reserve down in the uh, low felt in the northeast of the country. Um, he always had a passion for the outdoors and uh, the move to this wonderful wilderness area led him to pursue a career in anything that would involve him in nature. He completed a BSc honors degree in environmental analysis and management at the University of Pretoria in 2014. And following this, he spent uh, two years working in uh, Klaseri Private Nature Reserve um, and birding became an everyday hobby of his. During this time, he was introduced to the Ground Hornbill Project. And uh, um, Carl, you'll have to tell us what APNR stands for. I'm afraid I, I quickly couldn't find it, but um, I'm sure you'll mention that. Um, and he knew that he wanted to be a part of such, uh, such a project. Um, he now manages the conservation side of the Ground Hornbill Project, and uh, he's doing a PhD study on ground hornbills, the aim of which is to investigate the social structure of southern ground hornbills and to understand how individual group members contribute to two vital group functions, namely territory defense and reproduction. And these are two poorly understood topics. Kyle, I'm sure you're going to tell us a lot more about uh, these amazing birds and your work. And uh, I'd like to hand over to you and please share your screen. Welcome once again. Good to have you with us. Over to you. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, that's a great intro. Um, yeah, I am Kyle. Just want to take a moment to, to thank you for organizing all of this stuff, whoever it was. It's a great initiative. and really cool to be part of it. So as Rick mentioned, my name is Carl Mark Middleton. I am a student at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, currently busy with my PhD on these big black birds of Southern Africa, uh, with my project entitled The Individual Contributions to Group Behavior in Cooperatively Breeding Southern Ground Hornbills. So before I continue, I just want to take a quick moment and thank everyone involved in the project. Um, my supervisors and my assistant Carrie, National Geographic and the FITS itself for all their funding, all our very generous donors, as well as all the people along the way who have helped with sightings and equipment, just a big thanks to one and all. So about the birds themselves, jumping straight into it, I hope all of you have, have, have had the chance to actually see these birds before, before but if you haven't, that these large terrestrial big black birds that are unfortunately listed as endangered within South Africa. So out the, the rest of their range, they're vulnerable, but within South Africa, they are endangered. So they live to about 50 to 60 years old in the wild, very old, and they are entirely fornivorous. So they eat pretty much everything they can overpower from insects up to things like the size of hares. They're cooperative breeders, which means that they live in these groups and the entire group will contribute to the, the raising of offspring. Within the ground hornbill species, they live in these groups of about two to 12 individuals, and it's, it consists of a single adult female followed by male helpers, which varies in age. Now, I'm just going to highlight that point because I am going to come back to it at a later stage. They also occupy these extremely large territories of about 100 square kilometers and have a very low productivity with, with them being able to produce a maximum of one chick per year per group. So very low and, and slow productivity. So the site where I'm located is the APNR, which obviously I'm going to mention is, is stands for the Associated Private Nature Reserves in the northeastern part of South Africa. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty much just a collection of five privately owned reserves on the border of the Kruger National Park. So it's open to Kruger, but it's just privately owned. <laughs> it's also the site of the Fitzpatrick Institute's long-term study on the species. So the project's been going for about 20 years now. So we have this wealth of information on the nesting sites, the group territories, the group sizes, as well as all the ringed individuals within the area. If you have a look at that, that picture on the bottom left there, you can see there's a whole bunch of dots surrounded by, by polygons. Uh, the dots are nesting sites and the polygons are actually the territories of all the groups which we monitor. So it just gives you an idea of, of the area that we monitor and that we do kind of have a good idea of, of what's happening there. Excuse me. So cooperation. 
It's group living, obviously, and it's it's relatively common, yet it's intriguing because individuals contribute towards the group benefit, but this comes at an individual cost. And if you look at breeding and reproduction, individuals forego their own reproduction to provide energetically costly help to others. This essentially makes us question its stability and how it may evolve. The way to understand it is to look at the costs and benefits associated to the different individuals, since evolution itself actually operates at the level of the individual. In simple terms, the benefits need to outweigh the costs to that individual. To each individual, the benefits need to outweigh the costs. And to actually analyze this, we need to look at who is contributing and how much they are contributing to the different behaviors. So the aim of my, my study is actually to investigate the social structures within the species and understand how the different individuals within these groups contribute towards territory defense and reproduction, which are both two vital group functions for, for group survival. So we're going to start with the territory defense. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this before, but um, the ground hornbills are relatively well known for their, you know, their morning booming vocalization, since they use it as a means of long distance between group communication, but they also use it as a means to advertise and defend their territories. Can you hear that on that side? Very quiet, but just. Okay, well, so there's, there should be more. Anyway, um, but while these, these vocalizations are really well known, um, they've never actually been analyzed in detail and little is known about who is actually contributing within these groups what information they're actually conveying with these vocalizations, how they're structurally organized, and what is the actual function of them. So all those to kind of look, in order to see how they're defending their territories, you need to analyze their vocalizations since they use it as a means to advertise it and defend their territories. <clears throat> so to do this, we obviously need to get recordings of the birds and we've managed to get 10 groups throughout the APNR, so, so throughout our study site. And it kind of looks a little bit like this. It's also going to be soft. So yeah, you probably couldn't hear that, but you can see the, the, the birds moving on those branches there. And I mean, already here we can see, so this is their morning chorus call the entire group is not taking part. So we can already kind of see that not everyone is doing the same amount of work to, to maintain these territories. We then decided we're gonna look a little bit further into these, uh, into these vocalizations. And we thought, okay, let's see if there's a difference between the male and the female calls. So in this, this um, top left graph over here, you can see this is just, the pink would be the females and the turquoise would be the males. And it's just showing the frequency differences between the two. So the females are calling it a slightly higher frequency to that of the males. On the other side over here, we have the, the syllable duration, which is just the call duration. So how long the calls are. And there's, there's much less of a difference there or a lot, much less of a noticeable difference there. When we combine the two though, so in this case, we have frequency on the Y axis here and then time on the X axis, we get this very, very clear difference between the two, between the males and the females. And actually you can distinguish them with 92% accuracy. So we then thought to ourselves, okay, so there is this clear difference between, between the male and the female calls. But since there's only a single female in each group, that should then technically allow us to, it should act as a, as a signature to that group. You know, they, if they can, if their calls are distinct, and they have signatures, then it'll distinguish between groups. So this graph is a bit unusual, I know. Um, on the y-axis here, we have the frequency, and then on the x-axis, we have time. And this is essentially what a ground hornbill call looks like graphically. So if I explain it in a different way, this again is a call, and the call, up, call is made up of different syllables. So if I, if I use the word vocalizations, for example, vocalizations. So those different syllables make up a word, the same way that these different colors make up a word for the in ground hornbills. So the blue, for example, will indicate sec the first syllable, orange, second syllable, and all the rest. But it also shows, so the different colors, so the blue here will show one call at that frequency, 
as well as that length that the call goes on for and it explains then when the second call happens also the frequency and the duration so you can kind of get an idea graphically what a ground horn will vocalization looks like this graph is actually a picture from a single female from one group and when we compare this female to other females from this from different groups we begin to see these these very clear differences between them So these, I mean, this is just graphic representation, but this essentially shows us that the females themselves have their own signature calls. They produce calls that are their own unique melodies. This actually allows for the birds themselves to recognize each other, but also allows us to recognize different groups based on their vocalizations alone. We've tested this already using um, algorithms, computer algorithms, and we actually got a, a uh, classification of 89% of to actually classify them correctly, which is really great. And I mean, it's still, it's still early days in this process. So obviously now, now we know these birds can, they produce these sounds that can be identified and people, birds themselves can recognize each other. They have the potential to recognize each other. The final part of our vocalizations and territory study is to look at whether they can actually recognize each other. So this, the calls contain the signature, but can they recognize those signatures? So we do a thing called a playback experiment where we will arrive at the nesting site before dawn. We'll set up a little camouflage tent and a loudspeaker. The speaker will be about 200 meters from the nesting site. And we will just sit there and we wait for these birds to, to fly in. Once they're at the nest, then we actually play call to them. So we'll either play what we call a neighbor call. So that would be a call that this, this particular group would be used to hearing. So it would be a group that's on the directly neighboring territories. And then we play uh, four days later, we'll play a stranger group. So we'll play a, the calls of another group that this group has never heard before. We then analyze whether they can actually recognize each other, how they're contributing, uh, what they're actually doing, who is contributing, etc etc so it's been really interesting so far we, we've still got a few more of these experiments to go but so far it seems like actually the adults and the sub adults are doing most of the work and the juveniles do nothing in fact they actually while the rest of the group will almost approach the speaker the juveniles will actually disappear and hide in the bush and wait until the wait until the actual intrusion is finished so really interesting stuff um it's possibly because there has been uh, kidnapping reported in the species, which is really, really interesting. So a group, a neighboring group has been shown to go and kidnap another group's juvenile, which is really interesting. But again, still early days with this. Um, the other side, the other side of uh, all this is looking at the, obviously that was the territory defense and the other side is looking at reproduction, more in particular, the provisioning or the feeding rates. <coughs> so as I mentioned, the groups are made up of these these uh, males of different ages. So you have your adult, adult subadults, and juveniles. And then the female alone will incubate inside the nest. So they'll either be feeding her or the chicks inside of the nest. So we're analyzing how much they're actually feeding. And what we found so far is that again, the adults are doing most of the work. The subadults are doing a little bit less and the juveniles are actually doing pretty much nothing. Um, Adults will feed about three, three times a day, subadults about one and a half times a day on average, and juveniles hardly ever. Um, we've actually seen the juveniles taking food from the other chicks, so even a negative, a negative interaction there. So we can already, we can already start seeing this pattern now of, you know, that the older birds are doing more work. Again, with this, to further this, this provisioning uh, data, we're looking at how, how their feeding rates are actually affected by climate. So you can imagine on a cool morning or a cool day, the feeding rates of these birds would be relatively frequent. Um, but when things get a bit warmer, you know, as they do in this, in this area, they get really hot. The birds become a lot more heat stressed. And so you'd imagine that their feeding rates would decrease because they're gonna spend more time thermoregulating than actually foraging and feeding. And this is exactly what we found. Um, this graph, you don't need to focus too much on it, but the red line there just shows that the feeding rates of these birds actually decrease with an increasing temperature. So the hotter it is, the less they're actually feeding the chicks. So moving into this climate change stuff and, you know, things are bound to just get hotter in this area. 
the birds themselves as well, they live in these harsh and climate, harsh climates. So you'd imagine that they're used to it, but they're cooperative breeders. So the question there comes in is that, do they then live in these cooperative groups as a means to actually buffer the harsh conditions? So do they, because it's so hot, do they then live in these groups as a means to just, you know, get by? To say, so if one bird's struggling, there's more individuals to actually keep the chick going, to increase their success. So to analyze this, I'm using my, my long-term data on species just to kind of get an idea. We've got 20 years of data on all our group sizes and things. So we're using that to analyze, um, you know, if this is actually the case. Are they living in groups as a means to buffer these harsh, harsh conditions and breed successfully? So in conclusion, my, uh, my PhD aims to improve the social system understanding within the species, as well as provide insights into the individual costs and benefits associated with these behaviors. It also provides the basis to actually understanding cooperation within, within the species and how this behavior may, may have evolved. And then finally contribute towards the conservation of the species. As far as I know, Dr. Lucy Kemp did a talk a few weeks back I'm sure she spoke about a lot about their reintroduction process and how they artificially form groups to release back into the wild. So we're just trying to bolster this because they're artificially forming these groups, but we're just looking at which groups are actually crucial for them, for groups to persist and survive in the wild. So my research is just aiming to bolster that process. And that's pretty much what I, what, what the very short version of what we're doing here. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions are more than welcome. Fantastic, Carl. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I, I mean, I think it, there's some fascinating observations um, and, and conclusions that you've drawn already from your research. Um, and it must be wonderful to, uh, you know, to really get to understand what's going on with, with these birds. As you say, I think many of us um, have heard them calling in the wild. Um, it's, it's an iconic sound of, of those areas. Um, but to actually understand what's going on and who's doing what, uh, to me, that's fascinating. And that's to, really see the, yeah. to, to see the uh, difference, the individual differences between the vocalizations of the females is, is truly fascinating. Mm. Yeah, there, there are, uh, I see there is a question here from, uh, from Julio. Um, he says, how did you manage to map the territories? Um, he's not sure how, you precisely, how precisely you did it. For so many groups, um, was this done by tracking or observation? It's it's mainly, I mean, it's 20 years of data. It's, it's I mean, you're never really going to get, it's observation stuff. So it's not 100% accurate, but from the sightings data, because it's in the area, it's, there's a lot of lodging industries. So all the lodges and things will report their sightings to us. And then we go and we log it straight in. And judging by the group structure and the information they give us, we can then build you know the observation territories that we get there were a few of those those territories actually were from gps data as well so it kind of started the mapping out and then everything else was kind of filled in in between yeah thanks carl i think you know that wasn't really a citizen science talk right <laughs> but 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 the uh, but for me the the justification of having talks like this as part of this program is that this is the kind of stuff that all of us ought to know that uh, that we can talk you know with with some insight into about these birds so uh, um, you know we we um, we do a lot of stuff be, beyond what's just you know citizen science projects. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I hope that makes you feel better about what you presented in a citizen scientist hour. So yeah. that's Carl. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was no great. Worries. Thanks, Liz. So there is here a question from David. Um, he's asking how closely related are the birds within groups? So most of the birds, so they consist of these different aged individuals and the vast majority of the birds are actually uh, related. So they have previous, previous year's offspring. When a few, there might be one or two adult males that are unrelated, but the majority of the, of the birds within the groups are, are actually related individuals. Thank you. 